some more uh, chant accompaniment instruction. Uh, today I want to talk specifically about uh, using the square notes, the uh, Gregorian chant notation, instead of using uh, modern notated written out scores, uh, accompaniment scores. Uh, I went over a lot of this in the, the longer video, but uh, we'll just kind of review here the reason for using square notes instead of modern notation um, is, is primarily flexibility one, and uh, authenticity of interpretation uh, would be the second thing. Uh, flexibility, uh, when you read straight out of uh, the chant notation, you are not limited to a single key, you're not limited um, to a single type of accompaniment because you could you can uh, fill in the chord structure and the voicings as, as full or as um, sparse as you need to for the group you're playing for. Uh, and again, you could, you could play them uh, essentially anywhere with the chance movable dough system. Um, so those are the, uh, the practical advantages. Um, the other thing is authenticity. Um, it, it can be very difficult to get a, a really nice authentic chant sound uh, when you're playing from a written score. That's not to say that all written out and notated chant uh, accompaniment scores are bad. I, I've seen some good ones, um, but I'll be honest, I've never found one uh, that I liked everything about it. You know, when you're, you're accompanying the Ordinaries, for example, I've played uh, probably from, from a couple dozen different uh, accompaniments just to, to see how they sound. And there are moments of brilliance in each one and then moments where, you know, you're, you're not quite sure what the, the uh, arranger was thinking. So um, I, I find that, that reading and playing straight from the square notes, uh, combining that with a, a knowledge of chant theory, chant history, chant interpretation, um, can, can really give a much uh, better and more authentic uh, chant sound to your accompaniment. So the obvious question then, and I, I know this is a question a lot of people have, is, well, how do you do that? Um, how do you even get started with that if, if you've never uh, tried that before? You know, all you see on the page is, is the, the nooms uh, with the, the melody of the chant. So how do you make an accompaniment out of that? Well, again, this is something that assumes some music theory knowledge and some chant theory knowledge. But it's really, truly something that I think is learned best uh, by trial and error, and of course by listening. By listening to good accompanists uh, playing Gregorian chant. That's really how I learned. I, um, I studied under and, and um, just listened frequently to some very accomplished uh, chant accompanists and organists. And you pick up a lot just by hearing it done well. Uh, and then, like I said, trial and error. When I first started this, um, I'm going to show you the method that I used. Um, I would actually write in chords. I, I would look at a chant, uh, see what key it needed to be played in for the voices that were singing it, and then write in the chords that I was going to play uh, right on the, the, the page. Um, and then, slowly but surely, as I did this more and more, it got to the point where I realized I became so familiar with the patterns of chords that work well in each mode that I didn't need to write it down anymore. Um, and it just kind of becomes second nature. You can look at, at the, the square notes and know exactly what you want to do. Uh, but at first it's a lot of trial and error. You take the, the score and you, you play different chords over it until you hear one that sounds right, and then you write that one in. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the uh, Kyrie from Mass 9, Cum Jubilo, uh, for Feasts of uh, Our Blessed Mother, and we're going to go through the process that you can use uh, to try and come up with your own uh, accompaniment for this. Um, so, first of all, we want to look at the score and say, okay, uh, what key are we going to play this in? It's in mode one. It does go pretty low, but it also goes pretty high. It has a big range. Um, it's, it's going all the way from a la below the staff at the lowest point, all the way up to a re above the staff. Um, so that's a pretty big range that you're working with. So 
it's one of those ones that you got to find that happy medium. You don't want to take it too high, but you don't want to take it too low. I typically play this around what we would call in modern terms the D minor structure. So um, Do is C, uh, which means this, this chant starts on Re, so that's D. So the melody would start on D, key. So we're in a D minor um, sound, more or less. It's modal. Again, it's not modern uh, D minor key. It's modal, but we're going to be kind of centering around that, that D minor sound. So I think it's fairly obvious when we take a look at the first phrase here, the first incise, that a D minor is probably going to work pretty well there. It's D, F, G, A. So with the exception of the G, we just spelled out um, a D minor triad. So maybe we'll try that, see how it sounds. Seems to work pretty well. So we'll go up here and we'll just write in above the staff. And if you're going to write on a score, uh, you should print it out from a, a, a PDF of the Liber Uzoalis or, or something. Don't uh, don't write all over your, your books if you can avoid that. Um, Especially because when you first do this, there's, like I said, a lot of trial and error. You don't want to have to be writing, scribbling out, and erasing in a, in a priceless book. So I have a copy here printed out. So I'm going to write D minor as our first chord. Now we want to move on. Well, we probably want to change something here because if we just keep hovering around that chord for too long, it gets, it gets kind of boring and, and it doesn't bring out the beauty of the, the notes on the page. So uh, after we get through that, we might want to try and change it. So here's where the trial and error comes in. Try a couple different chords. Well, that was with an A minor there, and that works, that sounded good, but let's just try something else. Before we pencil that in, let's try something else. Let's try a third option. That was the first inversion of an A minor chord, and I kind of liked that. Um, and so let's go ahead and pencil that in on the, the Do. Put a A minor over a C. Um, let's see, so we have... And then I think it's pretty clear that that, that resolves back on Re, so we're back to the D, uh, so we end that phrase on a D minor. Now we go on to the next phrase. It's very similar, but a little bit different at the beginning. So we just finished our other one. Now that would work to just stay on your D minor, but maybe we want to do something different. So let's try something else. Let's try an F. that kind of ended up being in practice was almost just like a first inversion of a D minor and it didn't really work that well. Let's try an A minor maybe. And go right back to that D minor. It kind of helps you push into that phrase because you can hear uh, the movement of, of the melody there. It needs something to kind of force you into that. It, it drops way down there to the law. La, do, re, re, and it's got to come back up. So maybe instead of just staying on the D minor, we throw in that A minor to push it back up to the D minor. So instead, then we get and that kind of propels it into that. So I like that. Let's put the uh, A minor on the do, and then straight back to the D minor on the dotted punctum re. Now, the reason that we don't start with the A minor on the law 
is rhythmic. Um, the law at ki ki. Sorry, I couldn't find pitch. Ki di ki. That law right there is actually beat two. Uh, beat one is a rest. Uh, in this case, after the double bar, and we don't want to change our chords on a, a second beat. We only want to change the chord on a beat one. So we'll stay on the D minor after the first Kyrie. Uh, <laughs> maintains the integrity of the chant rhythm and it also propels as I said back up to the 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 ray and that that D minor structure okay so now we have so again we probably want to do something else in there to keep that moving uh, what would we want to try we have As I explained in the other video, uh, the Do major to Re minor chord is a great um, cadence to use uh, at the end of a phrase in mode one. So let's try that. Let's put that C in uh, actually on top of the Fa at Ele Ison. All the way up until the final Re of the phrase where we'll go back of course to D minor. So putting that all together now, we have uh, the first two Kyrie's. Now, the third Kyrie is the same as the first Kyrie. Uh, and so, objectively, you could just repeat what you did in the first Kyrie, but let's just take a different, uh, a different, a slightly different approach to this one, and see what we come up with. So what did I do there? I start on the Re minor, the D minor. Something that, that, that you can really do a lot of times uh, in chant accompaniment in a lot of different modes is essentially hold the root as the pedal tone here. So in this case, I'm going to hold down on the D. So right now I'm playing the D minor triad, D, F, A. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change out of that triad from uh, 3 and 5 down to 2 and 4. So we kind of have that suspended sound there. So we can go... Again, it just breaks up the monotony of holding that, that same chord for too long. So uh, you can notate that in whatever way would make sense for you. So we'll start on our D minor. Kiri A, the Do, I'm going to uh, C major chord, or Do major chord, and then at L, I'm going to a B flat major, uh, which is a Te major chord. And then I'm going to uh, uh, an A minor at uh, so, and then back to the D minor. Now I know in the last video I said that 5-1 that cadences are uh, really never appropriate in chant, 
or rarely appropriate. Um, and I should have clarified that to say major 5, 1. Um, in this case, because we're in a minor structure, when you're thinking in modern terms 5, 1, it's a, the minor version of 5 to the minor 1. Um, so that is an acceptable uh, cadence in mode 1 uh, and in chant is the minor 5 to the 1. We just want to avoid that, that modern sound that, that doesn't really work. Okay, so let's play through what we've got and see what we came up with. with the same phrase, there are lots of different things you can do. And as I did on that, that first Kyrie uh, section, uh, I kind of showed you what the, the initial trial, trial and error process is like. You know, you, you look at it and, and if you need to think like a modern musician for a few minutes, go ahead. Uh, you get to a point and you say, okay, I'm playing an F in this structure, so what chords are going to fit under F in a D minor structure? Well, B flat, maybe G minor, 7, um, F, and then you've got those inversions of those that, that you can use as well. And just try them. And, and remember what you're looking for is, is a, a good authentic chant sound, but also trying to avoid big jumps in, in your roots. And that's why it may be important to look for where you can use those first inversions. Uh, if you can keep the motion stepwise or smaller intervals, it sounds better and less chopped up than doing, you know, fifths or sixths or seventh movements that, that can be very awkward. So see where you can walk things around in, in stepwise patterns uh, to come up with, with those. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to write out the rest of that. That took long enough, but I'm going to go ahead and play through the entire Kyrie, and I'll just make up uh, the rest of the accompaniment as I play it, uh, so that you can see how how it goes on after you've practiced and practiced and practiced this, that you can just go through the rest of the piece without having to write it down eventually. nine you could see the the variety that I could put in there and you could have done that five six seven eight different ways that would have been perfectly acceptable and 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 nice and, and a lot of it does come down to what suits your ear 
uh, as I said, based on your understanding and your research and listening that you've done to good chant accompaniment. So trial and error, practice, practice, practice. I'm going to do something a little bit different here just to show you, uh, kind of to jump outside of the, the ordinary, uh, as in the ordinaries of the Mass. Uh, and let's look at a, a Magnificat antiphon from Vespers. This is for the 21st Sunday after Pentecost. I don't know if I've ever played this before. Certainly haven't played it as much as all of the ordinaries. So we're going to go through the same process a little bit more quickly here. I'll just show you what I'm doing uh, to write in some chords for this. So the melody goes... In Jesus, Filius tuus vivit, et credit ipse, et domus eos tota. So we're in mode three, uh, so we got to keep that, that in mind as we go. Um, and let's just dive right in. Okay, so I started on A. Uh, I'm making Do A for this. That's good. That's typically um, it's easiest for when you're singing psalms, and, and the Magnificat antiphon obviously leads into do the the canticle, the Magnificat canticle, which is set to a psalm tone. The reciting tone. For most groups, it's easiest to set on A in terms of, of being in a comfortable range. So that's kind of how I'm determining that that's the structure, the key structure I'm going to be working in here. So my first chord is going to be A. Which is T, uh, but in mode three, that leading tone sound often works best with a minor chord rather than the, the major chord alternative, which would be the E major or the Sol major. So we're going to go with uh, the C sharp minor there, uh, which is what well, I guess that's Me minor. Stay on the C-sharp minor, then go to D major, uh, which is Fa major. Walk it up to Sol major, which in this structure is E major. I stayed on an E major chord there, Sol major, but I put it over a D bass, okay? So I'm walking the bass down to get to a first inversion of an A chord here. So it's uh, E quad Okay, so we're staying on E, but we're going over the D bass, okay? And then it's an A over a C-sharp bass for a first inversion of that uh, Do chord. That's a first inversion Do that we're walking down to there. In quad So what I do there is, since I'm already in that first inversion of the And then I resolve that onto the, the F sharp minor chord, which again is La minor, at the end of that uh, phrase. Okay, so then we have in quad Okay, so now we move on. I'm not sure I liked that. Let me think about that. 
about this here. I like that much better. Okay, so there's that trial and error process, which I obviously I still do, and if I had just been sight reading this, I may have uh, chosen something that would not have been perfect, but since we have the luxury of writing it down right now, I get to, to change it. So, we just finished the last phrase. accent of philius. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the accent, but the, the note with the ictus gets the D major here. Philius. Okay, so philius. And then here on phi, I'm going to add the sixth in there, which actually essentially makes that, that a first inversion B minor. And then when that resolves, go down to the root position, B minor or Re minor. Okay, now we move on. Uh, we were at, let's see. And so what I'm just going to do there is we were at. Uh, I'm going to use a first inversion A or Do. And we're going to go ahead back up to that F sharp minor or that La minor chord at the end of that phrase. Because uh, modes 3 and eight are pretty closely related, but when we're speaking in, in modern terms, the mode three tends to center more around the, the minor uh, chords, uh, whereas mode eight tends toward more of the major chords. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so we'll end that phrase on F sharp minor. So that phrase now is... the B minor starting on domus on the uh, me on uh, do <laughs> the me on do this on the uh, Mi minor chord, which is C-sharp minor. Okay, let's have a listen and see how this uh, turned out. Uh, and if you were playing this at Vespers, you would um, give it an, an intonation to the priest. So you wouldn't actually accompany that first incise, the first phrase, the first time through, the priest would sing that, and you would come in at the asterisk. Now, after uh, you finish the Magnificat um, to the psalm tone and you repeat, then you would play the beginning. So I'll go ahead and play it now. chant with chords written in. And as I said, once you've practiced doing that enough times, writing them in enough times, and, and by enough times I mean hundreds of times, I, uh, um, I've i played uh, for a lot of vespers and a lot of masses and a lot of, accompanied a lot of chants, and I must have written chords in 
150 or 200 times before I was comfortable enough uh, with the structures and the patterns of the modes to quit. And I can't pinpoint a moment when I quit writing them in. It just kind of happened. It, it may have been one of those trial by fire things where I had to play for something on short notice and didn't have time to write them in and just had to, to wing it. And then I realized, oh, I guess I can wing it now. I've done this enough. So it's uh, repetitio mater studiorum. Just do it over and over and over again in practice, writing them in. And then little bits at a time, uh, take a chant and see if you can uh, just try to go through it. Uh, without writing anything in and come up with your own accompaniment. Um, don't be discouraged if, if it doesn't sound good the first few times. It, it takes practice. It really, really takes practice, but it's absolutely worth it, I can assure you. Um, yeah, so enjoy. And please, as always, if you have any questions, just leave a comment for me. I will uh, do my best to get back with you and answer your questions, and uh, I will have more videos on the way. God bless you.